we would like to thank and acknowledge our sponsors, DC3 Dreams and Voice Astro. DC3 Dreams provides high end observatory automation and web based multi user remote imaging. The AAVSO Net Observatories use DC3 Dreams ACP Expert for the Bright Star Monitors and other programs. The AAVSO Photometric All Sky Survey Project, also known as APAS, has used ACP Expert's AI scheduler to automatically acquire over 500,000 star fields, hands off, at a rate of 1,000 square degrees per night. This has resulted in photometry for over 128 million objects in about 99% of the sky. The Boyce Research Initiative and Education Foundation provides online astronomy education, observatory resources, and research experiences to students, student teams, and schools in order to learn how to perform observations, conduct research, and publish their results in scientific journals, such as the Journal of the AAVSO. Please check out their webpage to learn more about their work. Okay, now, uh, without any further ado, today's speaker is an astronomer at the University of Cambridge Institute of Astronomy. Her research focuses on accreting compact objects, so everything from the black holes at the hearts of quasars to the white dwarfs inside cataclysmic variables. She now works as a member of the Gaia Science Alerts team and makes use of the project to search for the extremely compact binaries formed by accreting double white dwarfs, which just sounds so cool. Today, she's going to be sharing with us a behind the scenes look at the workings of such a major astronomical survey, as well as discussing some of the most interesting transients which have been observed so far. So, ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to introduce Dr. Elme Breit. Dr. Breit, you can go ahead and um, begin now if you'd like. Thanks very much for inviting me, Lauren. Um, shall I share my screen? Give me a that. Um, there we go. Thanks very much uh, for the invitation. And uh, also, thanks very much for, for everybody uh, joining in. I mean, I. I would have, I thought that I would have preferred doing this talk in person, but then realizing, you know, how many people are able to join because we, we can do this online, you know, it's, um, that's, that's really a big benefit of, of all of this. So I'm really glad to be here. Um, as Lauren said, my main area of research is um, white dwarf binaries. Um, for example, the, the cataclysmic variables. But I know that there was an excellent talk on cataclysmic variables uh, towards the end of last year as part of the series. And so today I decided not to focus on that, um, but instead talk about um, transient surveys and specifically the, the Gaia Science Alert transient surveys that is discovering a lot of these uh, white dwarf binaries and other variable stars at the moment. And of course, variable stars are at the heart of, of what the AAVSO does, and uh, so I thought it, it would be appropriate. So I'll tell you a little bit about the survey, um, and then just very quickly, uh, towards the end, um, mention some of the interesting transients that uh, we've seen so far. Um, there are about 450 people working on, on Gaia as a whole, you know, all, all across Europe. Um, but the alerts team is, is much smaller and, and all based in, um, in Cambridge, plus a few other people who were in Cambridge before, um, but are still involved uh, at the new institutions that they, they moved to. Uh, we also have some support from CU5, which is the, the Gaia Photometric Processing Unit. Um, and this slide is, is here just to, to really acknowledge um, everybody that's involved, in particular, uh, Dr. Simon Hodgkin, who's been at the head of this project um, since the very start. And before I just launch straight into, into Gaia Alerts, I thought it's definitely worth just talking a little bit about, um, about Gaia itself, in case there is somebody that's not, not familiar with it. But also, if you are, you know, it's, it's the observations that Gaia do that, or the way that Gaia does its observations, that um, really um, sets the, the features of, of the alert survey and where all of the, the data comes from. So um, 
what is Gaia? Um, Gaia is a, a fully European mission with uh, input from um, a wide range of countries, um, and it's all overseen by the European Space Agency. It feels like only yesterday, but um, it was launched in, in December 2013, and in July 2019, it reached the end of its nominal five and a half year mission. But the spacecraft is still in good health, um, and it's continuing its observations now as an extended mission. Um, so it's still active and, and taking data, even though um, it fulfills all of the, the original uh, requirements and the original plan for, for the observations. Uh, the main goal of Gaia is to create a three-dimensional map of our galaxy, the Milky Way. And in order to do that, it needs to measure the positions, the distances, and the motions of, of the stars in, in our galaxy. And in addition to that, also the brightness and the chemical compositions of those stars. Now, with the most recent Gaia data release, uh, they are, there's detailed information of 1.8 billion stars um, of our galaxy. That's only about 1 or 2% of all of the total number of stars in our galaxy, but that already is 100,000 times more than anything that we had before Gaia. So the impact on astronomy has been huge, even though there is still a lot more data to come. One of the, the aspects in which this, um, this impact is, is most strong is, um, is these distances provided to stars. Because distance measurements is, is actually very hard to do. I mean, it took more than 170 years of telescope and technology development before this was done successfully for the first time, done, of course, by Friedrich Bessel in, in 1838. Um, and he was uh, rewarded with a variety of prizes and, and, and awards for this important work uh, that he'd done. Now, the method that he used is is a method that's actually very familiar to us. It's called parallax. Um, but perhaps you didn't realize that that's also the way that distances to stars can, can be measured. And it's actually the same way in which Gaia measures the distances to stars. Now, I have here a little bit of fun um, just to illustrate the, the concept of, of parallax. We're all at home, so we can do this. If you hold out your thumb, and you block out the, um, the little smiley face at the center of the screen, you close one eye, just like the smiley face is doing, and then alternate between the two eyes. You can see that it appears and disappears behind your thumb. If you hold your thumb closer to, to, your, to your eyes and do the same, you can see that that apparent motion is, is even larger. <clears throat> and that's exactly what happens um, with the, the distance measurements to stars except that we don't use the distance between our two eyes, we use the largest um, baseline that is available to us, and that's our orbit around the sun. So in January, um, if, if in January we're over here in, in the orbit and we look at this foreground star, we see it projected um, around, uh, among these background stars uh, over here. Six months later, in July, and we're in this position, we look at that same star again, and now it's projected uh, among these stars over here. Um, so when we, when we move in, in our orbit around the sun, this star will trace out a little circle on the sky from, from our perspective. And the closer to us it is, the larger that circle is. The further away, the smaller it is. And from that, we can calculate the distance uh, to the star. So to make uh, measurements that are, that are as, as precise and as accurate as, as that, the spacecraft has to be very stable. And for that reason, Gaia does not have any mechanical moving parts on, on the spacecraft. It makes its observations uh, with, with two cameras, I'll play this video here, that are the two cameras are separated by uh, 106 degrees, and then it just slowly spins, and these two cameras sort of sweep across the sky to make these um, continuous measurements. 
each star is observed around 140 times um, over the lifetime of, of the survey um, as, it, as it sweeps around. I'll let that finish. Um, until it, it covers the whole sky. There's a, uh, the spacecraft rotates and there's a slight precession so that it covers the, the whole of the sky. And if we look at that, um, no, that happens every time, I don't know why. There we go. If we look at that, um, that scanning law, as it's called, that scan of, of the, the spacecraft across the sky, this is, this is what it looks like, full sky, and it will go on to show the full five years of, of the mission. It's kind of pretty, I think. Um, the color scale here uh, indicates the number of observations at each point on the sky gets. And so you can see that depends very much on the exact position in on the sky. Um, so if you, uh, any star that you want to know how many observations you, it'll get, um, it's, it's very predictable, but it's uneven, the, the coverage on the sky. And there's some areas that will get many more observations, while others will get, get fewer. But in general, um, each star will be observed around between uh, 70 to 140 times uh, over the lifetime of, of the survey. And typically, the observations are uh, scheduled, um, you'll get a pair of observations separated by 106 minutes. Um, and then another pair of such observations uh, about two to four weeks later. And of course, all of these um, measurements are brightness measurements as well. And so this actually probes the ability of all of these stars on a wide variety of, of timescales. And this is ideal for studying the variability of sources. And that's exactly where Gaia Alerts comes in. Gaia Alerts exploits this, this variability um, in, in the data to, to search for new sources where there wasn't anything before the last time that, that Gaia scanned that, that part of the sky, or even if there is an old source that brightened or faded significantly um, throughout uh, the survey. Let that run for, for a second. Sorry, I lost my presentation. So just enjoy the video while I try and get back to my to my presentation. Maybe try. Pressing. There we go. Oh, there you go. I think, there you go. Yeah. Uh, there we go. Okay. So as I said, Gaia um, uh, uses this, this um, variable brightness information and then look for, for variable uh, sources in, in the full sky. Um, but that's, of course, nothing new. Um, there are a variety of other, uh, other surveys uh, that have similar goals and have um, specific goals and, and its own strength. So you'll recognize a whole lot of these names in, in the figure on the right, um, and also even see some new ones like, uh, like LSST that, that will be coming very soon. Now, Dr. Thing, Breed? Yes. Excuse me. I just wanted to let you know that your bookmark bar is now visible. If you uh, oh. full screen the presentation again, that might okay. fix it. Thank you. I think hmm. the F11 key might do that. Thank you. Thanks very much. <laughs> okay. Uh, so go back here. The thing that makes um, Gaia uh, different from all of these other surveys is that if in any of these surveys there is any doubt about whether uh, an alert or, or something that brightens is real or an artifact, um, then you can always go back to the images. Um, and see, and you look for things like um, solar system objects that move through the field or um, uh, 
cosmic rays in, in, the, uh, in the image that affected your data or, or things like that. But Gaia is a catalog driven survey. It doesn't produce any images. All of the data processing for Gaia is done on board the spacecraft. And then what is done linked to Earth is essentially just a catalog. So we cannot go and, and inspect the images. We have various ways to, to check for, um, for artifacts, but uh, that also needs uh, a lot of data. And in general, we need to be a little bit more conservative with what we uh, consider um, an alert. Gaia's astrometric or positional uh, uh, observations are always going to take preference. That's always going to be the most important um, for the survey. And whatever we get from, from the alerts is a bonus on, on top of that. We can't change where the spacecraft is pointing um, and we can't change any of the, you know, the sensitivities or, or anything like that. So, as I said, we will always be a little bit more conservative about what is uh, considered an, an alert. And, and, and for that reason, we might miss some, um, but we'll, we'll get back to, to, to that as well. So what, excuse me, what are the advantages of, of using Gaia then? Um, the first thing is that it's, it's a complete all sky survey that goes very deep and to high spatial resolution. There are of course some other surveys that, that have all sky uh, coverage as well, like Assassin for example, um, but Assassin doesn't go as deep and it doesn't have the spatial resolution that, that Gaia does. Actually, Assassin uses uses that to their advantage, um, but it you know so again it depends on exactly what it is that you're looking for in in your survey. Um, being in space, it also means that uh, Gaia doesn't have any interruptions from from weather, um, and I think all observers among you will will realize that that can be a real frustration sometimes. But it also means that. Gaia can alert on things that fade from any ground-based observations or really have a, a tough time alerting on things that, that fade um, because it's very difficult to monitor exactly clouds or dark clouds coming, coming through. So they hardly ever alert on, on such things, even though they, they will observe, will observe them. Um, so in, in, in this uh, figure on the right, I'll do that. Um, I show one of these alerts where um, we reported on something that faded. This is a young stellar object. Uh, and in here, um, this was a, a, an outburst already when, when Gaia started its observations. And over time, the outburst ended and it returned back to its quiescence um, over here. And this star symbol here, that's when, when Gaia alerted on it as it faded. But this also shows another feature of, of the Gaia observations in that um, every observation has an associated color uh, that, that comes with it. So initially when we started, uh, when uh, the observation started, this yellow symbol here, you can see this uh, spectrum over here. Gaia has a, a blue photometer and a red sensitive photometer on, on board as well, which we call BP and RP. Um, and here it measures colors in, in those filters. It's actually a very low resolution spectrum, uh, but in, especially for faint objects, you know, you can integrate them and, and get a color uh, from, uh, from the spectra. So here you can see um, when it, the object is bright, there's a lot of flux in the, in the blue photometer in BP, and it's kind of similar to the flux in, in the red photometer RP over here. And as the object faded and it comes to down to quiescence here, this, this um, bluish uh, point over here, this is a spectrum at the bottom. Um, you can see that the blue flux has almost completely disappeared. And now it's completely dominated by the red flux. The quiescent color of, of this object is, is, is very red, as is common for uh, a lot of the, the young stellar objects. And so we can monitor the, the changes in color, and that can also help to identify the, um, the type of object it is. Uh, the last thing that I think is, is a real advantage of Gaia is uh, the very accurate astrometry, positional observations that it makes. 
So for a uh, transient like uh, supernovae that you want to know exactly where in the galaxy it is, or things like tidal disruption events, stars that get ripped apart by the gravitational field of, of um, the black hole at the center of the galaxy. Um, for those kind of objects, it is very important to know exactly uh, where this occurs. So what is done is that even if another survey sees a, a transient uh, before Gaia does, um, the coordinates will always get updated um, to, to the Gaia coordinates after that. Um, and what's called the ground truth astron uh, astrometry. Um, and this is by the, uh, the TNS, uh, the transient name server, to where a lot of these uh, alerts are, are being uh, uploaded. Right. So how have we done so far? I'll move this away. Um, the, so far, we uh, published 17,310 alerts. That's accurate from was about an hour ago. That's the latest addition to that. Um, and you can see on the, this plot on the right that we publish around uh, an average of 12 alerts per day at the moment. Um, you can also see that this changed uh, over time. Um, and I like to think of this as our learning curve. Uh, to me, it was really interesting actually to see that despite all of the, the preparation and all the uh, planning that was done before, just how much there was to learn um, as soon as real data comes in. Um, every, all of these kinks um, in, the, like, uh, in this uh, plot over here indicates a point where we had to make, or we made some changes to our detection, detection algorithms, to our variability parameters and things like that to be able um, to find more alerts, to be more complete on, um, on the kinds of systems that, that we found. One thing to know also about Gaia is that it, uh, we exclude as far as possible any regular variables like um, pulsating stars or eclipsing binaries. Um, and the reason for that is that it, there is a separate uh, group within the Gaia team uh, that looks specific, uh, specifically at um, variable uh, objects. And, and they uh, will do the processing and the details for the pulsating stars um, and eclipsing variables. And so we leave that to them. So unless it's something like an eclipsing cataclysmic variable, which goes into outburst, um, we uh, will not, not publish uh, the eclipses of that. If it does go into outburst, uh, it's, it, it is an alert, and then we will publish it. So there will be some eclipsing systems in, in there as well. So the million dollar question, what are they? Um, and every time I see this question, I cannot help thinking about this cartoon because sometimes it just really feels like they all look the same. Um, but fortunately, it's not quite as bad as that uh, because these, uh, looking at the, at the uh, various light curves uh, and also there's these BPRP spectra, we can make uh, some guesses at, at what these systems are. So in the, in the top here, I show some um, identified systems. This is a cataclysmic variable. It's actually an eclipsing cataclysmic variable. You see these dropout points here. Those are points where Gaia observed it while it was in eclipse. Uh, this is a, a supernova 1A. It was detected and then decayed over the next few months. This is a young stellar object. Um, and this is a microlensing event. And you can see for all of these, their spectra look quite different. The, something with a disk outburst tends to be very blue. Um, the supernova 1A, the spectra do change quite a lot throughout the brightness evolution here. The YSOs, as I mentioned before, is, is quite red. Um, and these are uh, microlensing events. Um, they're difficult to, to recognize uh, or to identify from, from the spectra, uh, but if they are much easier to recognize uh, in, terms of their, in terms of their light curves like this. Uh, so um, what we do is to, to, to look at the, at the combination of the, the light curves and the spectra, but there's still some confusion. Um, uh, things like uh, very young type 1a supernovae and CVs and outbursts actually look very similar, very blue in, in these uh, very low resolution spectra. So they're sometimes difficult to, to distinguish between. 
But then you can go to more contextual information, look at um, you know, how far the nearest galaxy is from that, and that can help you decide whether um, it is a supernova or, or a CV. And of course, there's still some that is not, uh, you know, not clear, uh, distinct, clearly distinguished, um, because there are some hostless uh, supernovae, and there are some uh, CVs in which the uh, the quiescent object is below the detection limit. Um, but this is something that we continue to work on, um, and we keep improving this this all of the time. And uh, one thing that that makes it a little bit uh, tricky is that these spectra are essentially uncalibrated. The, the Gaia data is, is really complicated and processing the data fully takes many months. And so at that point, there will be no point in, in, in um, alerting on these objects for, for further observations. So um, What's done is, is just a basic calibration of this data to make it useful. So this, you can see, is just in, in pixel space, but it's not calibrated in wavelength. Um, and for the same reason, it's not calibrated, quite calibrated in flux yet. It's just the counts that, that, that come from, from these spectra. Um, and that makes the classification sometimes a little bit, or more detailed classification, a little bit hard. But in the next guide data release, there will be some, some calibrated spectra, and we look forward to, to start using those as well um, to improve the, the alert uh, classification program as well. Uh, this is about uh, follow-up of the alerts. Um, and I think it's fair to say that follow-up is probably the bottleneck uh, for most transient surveys, because the, the transient rate uh, is, is always much higher than is possible to follow up with, with other telescopes. So what I'm showing here are the um, our alerts which are classified at the moment. And you can see that it's heavily dominated by, by supernovae. But you have to be careful um, interpreting this plot because uh, we know that most of the follow up is driven by dedicated supernova surveys. Um, groups of, of scientists who are looking specifically for supernovae, following up things that, that are probable supernovae, and less so uh, some of the other types of transients. So this is not a representation of all of the alerts in the survey, but rather it just shows the, um, the ones that have been followed up so far. You can see, for example, in, in the sky plot over here, there are a lot of gray points um, concentrated along the galactic plane here. And the gray points are the, the unclassified objects, the ones that we do not know. Um, and so the fact that they're all along the galactic plane um, suggests that they are mostly stellar in, in origin, because um, those are the ones that at the moment are, are least follow up in, um, in, in the survey. But as I say, that is that's something that's actually true for for most of, of these transient surveys. There are just too many interesting things out there to be able to uh, follow them all up. So this is just to to uh, explain to you how um, how we get from guy observations to um, publishing the alerts. So we start up here in the top left. Gaia observes uh, around 1,230 square degrees per day. Now that's about double the size of the Orion constellation, roughly. Um, but of course, stretch out in this, this long strip uh, across the sky. As I said before, all of the Gaia data is processed on board, and it's also stored on board uh, until there is an opportunity uh, to, to downlink the data. And this can can be as much as you know, maybe 12 hours or so that observed data is, is still waiting to be downlinked uh, on, on the spacecraft. When there is an opportunity, the data is, is downlinked, and this itself can take you know, between eight and, and 10 hours, depending on, on how much data there is. And from this, uh, the data is sent to um, 
to uh, the Science Operations Center in Madrid, in Spain, for what's known as the initial data treatment. Now, this is these um, initial calibrations that I, that I talked about. This looks at the, the spacecraft telemetry. Um, all of the, the data comes in. It applies some, um, some calibrations, uh, some basic calibrations, um, so that the data is useful for uh, various other groups within the guy community who then each take their little packet of data and and do more uh, more accurate calibration of it for us um, the data is, is sent to to Cambridge um, where we uh, first create a light curve for each of these objects um, from all of the previous uh, Gaia scans that they were, and this is a lot. I mean, this is this is around uh, 60 million observations of 37 million sources on on average. But at times when when Gaia is scanning through the the galactic plane or tangential to the to the galactic plane, um, this can go up by a lot. I mean, to uh, as I wrote there, more than 300 million observations of 200 million sources. So clearly, this processing, um, both in IDT um, and the alerts processing, is also going to add some time. That's about ten hours and, and six hours that that this adds to the uh, to the processing time. Then we take um, the one thousand alert candidates that that we get from from these light curves and and the uh, variability detection. Um, and we do some filtering on those. So here we remove artifacts like, uh, for example, diffraction spikes from, from bright stars or planets that's moved through the field um, and, and things like that. And also to a small extent, um, some of the, the pulsating variables and, and stars like that that, that we do not, uh, do not publish. That decreased the, the number of, of alert candidates by uh, about a factor of 50, so we end up with uh, 20 to 30 alerts. And each of these are then inspected by I by at least two members of, of the alerts team uh, to decide whether they are uh, ready for, for publishing. This is sort of the final step where we remove eclipsing variables and, and pulsating uh, stars from, uh, from the sample. And then we publish these alerts, um, it's around 10 alerts per day gets, gets published to a website and where we would then make them available um, for, for further observations. Uh, importantly, all of our data are immediately public. So the moment that we decide that something is, is um, an alert, it gets published to, to this, this web page over here. And all of the data on that source um, from the alert itself, but also all of the data from before the alert was issued, and also future data on that object all becomes public. So we, we update um, every publication every day um, with new data that, that's coming. So it's also worth uh, going back to old alerts and, and seeing what new has happened in, um, in their light curves. Um, I'll show you an uh, this, this alerts index uh, just on the on the next slide, um, but I'll point out as well that if you'd like to do more automated processing of the alerts rather than looking them one by one as they come in, because seventeen thousand three hundred can be quite a lot to look through one by one, um, they're also published at the same time to CSV files and VO events um, to look through and, and to, uh, to to select the specific type of, of object that that you're interested in. So here is um, what that alerts index looks like. Um, there's some, some basic information here, things like the alert index, um, the coordinates and, and uh, magnitude of, of the target. Uh, this magnitude here is the, uh, the brightness at, at the time of alert, and then some historical mag if it is an old source uh, that, was, that was observed before. We have the times uh, for when it's observed and published and as i said because we have you know so many steps that that takes time you know that um uh it can take you know between two to three days um from the time that guy has observed uh, one of these these alerts to the time that it's actually published so that is something uh you should uh 
consider as well. You know, it's it's not that great for for things that need a very fast reaction. Um, but that's just the complexity of the data and, and how it works. But it's still, um, you know, for things like um, flare stars and so on, uh, you may miss the flare in, 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 in terms of follow-up observations. But for a lot of other things, for quasar variability or cataclysmic variables, and certainly for supernovae, which stay bright very long, um, that it is certainly still possible to, to carry on with the follow-up observations after that. Um, so we give the, both the observed um, time at Gaia and the time that we, we publish the alert. Um, and then we have a classification column here as well. So this will only have a classification if it is a confirmed or a known, you know, long time known object. Otherwise, um, it'll be unknown as, as these two over here. Um, but we also include this comment field where um, the eyeballers can add some information that might help uh, anyone who looks at this with with some of the classification. So, for example, you know th this object is is very blue or it's very red, or detections at other wavelengths, you know, in in in, in other surveys, um, and things that might help with with the with the classification of that. So each of these alerts, um, if you click on this link here, has a dedicated page with all of its information on there. Here you can see. Uh, an image of the field, and you can um, switch over there to you know various other wavelengths uh, that you you want to look at. This is uh, from Aladdin, if if you know Aladdin. This is the Gaia light curve. So this is a, a supernova, and you can see that it was never observed, uh, never uh, something anything seen at this position until the the supernova eruption, or supernova outburst, and then it decayed over the uh, the next few months, um, and now we don't don't see it anymore. The light curve for this object are all found at the bottom here, and there is also a button where you can can download all of the data. And here you'll find the spectra for for each of those those observations. So every alert um, has a page like this, um, where you can find all of the guy information on it. And this is the page that I said that gets updated as well uh, with with future. Uh, Gaia uh, observations. Right. Um, so just very quickly, uh, I'll say something about you know some of my my favorite alerts, uh, because even among seventeen thousand, you can certainly pick out some some favorites. Um, and actually, uh, all three of these systems I'm going to be talking about has some input from uh, from AAVSO members as well. So they they really are. Um, to me, uh, uh, very interesting alerts. Gaia 14 AAE over here um, was only the fifth alert that ever that, that Gaia observed, and it turned out to be a very rare type of object. It's an almost pure helium binary. As you can see in this, this um, figure at the bottom right, um, it's very similar to, to cataclysmic variables in that it has a, a white dwarf accreting from a companion uh, through an accretion disk, but there is no um, hydrogen in these systems at all. At the time, um, there were fewer than 50 of, of these systems now. They sometimes are called AMCVN stars after the first of these ones uh, that was discovered. Um, and there were fewer than 50 of, of these known, but what made this one special is that it was the first one in which the white wolf was fully eclipsed. And the, here you see a model of um, some follow-up data uh, of the system. Um, and it allows us to, to measure the binary parameters of, of this, and that was never possible, never before possible for this class of objects. So this um, is the most accurate um, constraints that we have for any object of, of this kind. And we can measure the, the radii of the stars from the eclipse um, and from that the, the masses of, of the systems. And what are uh, masses of the of the uh, component stars? Um, and what it showed us is that um, these binaries don't actually form in the way we thought they do. And so it really forced us back to the drawing board to go and think about exactly how uh, these systems formed. 
uh, we expected that this, you know, something with a period as 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 long as this, you know, I say long, it's only 49.7 minutes. Um, but we always thought that a system with a period like this should be a double white dwarf. Um, but from that mass and radius measurements, it was clear that that is not the case here. And so it cannot have formed through the double white dwarf way that, that we always uh, thought I did. So that really well, is still challenging us. Um, this is a few other eclipsing uh, AMCV and stars have been found, but it's still the only one um, in which the white dwarf is, is fully eclipsed. So this will continue to be observed for, for a long time. This one is called Gaia 18 CVI, and I don't know what it is, um, but I still think it is a, it is a very interesting object. Um, it was first discovered in 2018 after an eight magnitude outburst in Gaia, you see the observation over here, and it was only seen once after um, uh, when it started to find and then disappeared below Gaia's um, uh, detection limits uh, again. Uh, it's about 22nd magnitude, if, if I remember correctly. Um, so getting spectroscopy on this object has been a challenge so far, uh, but we, uh, we will still continue doing that to, to decide, uh, to, to figure out exactly what this is. Unfortunately, um, it was not in a great position in the sky uh, when it was discovered. Um, and I didn't think that it would be possible to, to observe this, but uh, AVSO member Josh Hamsch um, observed this um, heroically, you know, followed it for, for 12 nights battling twilight and, um, and also very high air mass. Um, but he measured from his data a period of, of 68.3 minutes. Now this period again is, is very interesting because it's similar to the longest periods AMCVN stars that we know, but it's also um, in the correct period range where some um, short period cataclysmic variables, um, hydrogen cataclysmic variables uh, can form. The thing that's, that um, puzzles me about this is that um, all of the other very short period um, uh, cataclysmic variables that we know um, have very frequent outbursts. But for this object, we only know about one other object, and that was recorded on, on the Harvard dash plates in May 1949. So uh, that's certainly a long time ago. Um, and that makes a, if, if that is really the, the, uh, the previous outburst to this one, um, that would make it the longest recurrence time um, between two outbursts that we know of one of these systems. And that will tell us um, a lot about, you know, how, uh, how many uh, other CVs there might be that, um, that are like this, that, that we don't know because they don't um, have outbursts. And it will also tell us about the accretion rate in these objects and how long it takes for, uh, for these outbursts to occur. As I said, it's been a bit tricky to, uh, to get spectroscopy of this object given that it's so faint. But again, we continue uh, working on that and, and hopefully we'll uh, get that um, pretty soon. And then finally, uh, this is Gaia 14AYE. And um, you see at the top right, the really crazy light curve that uh, it had within the, the Gaia alerts. Now, I'd never seen something like that before, but fortunately our colleagues at uh, Warsaw University recognized this as, um, as a binary, as, as a microlensing event, I mean, so just to explain how, how that works, I have this um, picture here on the left uh, of this castle. And if you uh, imagine looking at this castle through a lens, you, know, it, you get this inversion and distortion of, of the image. Now, the same thing can happen with gravity, that gravity can lens the image of a, a, of a distant star like this. And this model here on the right shows um, how the magnification changes, how the brightness of a source changes as these two stars um, move uh, past e each other. Now, the light curve of, of 16AYE was even more complicated than that. Um, and so a huge follow-up campaign uh, followed. Um, there were 62 telescopes 
involved in this campaign and they collected over 25,000 data points um, in, in the system. Uh, what I show here on the right is, is the, the light curve um, as well as the model that they came up with. They showed that um, in this case, the lens was not a single star, but instead it was a binary that was lensing a, a very different star. Now, there's no reason why a, a binary cannot be a lens like a single star, but because this is not my field of uh, research at all, I'd never thought about that. And so um, it really opened my mind about, you know, some of the things that that we can see and you know that we should be open to to discovering and that's the reason why it makes it onto onto my list of favorites i'm going to leave it there with uh, the url of of the alert survey um, i would encourage you to to go have a look at it um, and also maybe to go and find your favorites among among the alerts there um, thank you very much All right, thank you very much, Dr. Breed. That was fascinating. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, start the Q&A here. Let me just get out of full screen. Um, Do here you we need go. me to stop the sharing or is that right? Uh, it's it's up to you. We, you, you don't have that. to stop it for the Q&A. I can, I can leave the URL up if, if people are interested. Yeah. Go ahead and leave up that URL so people can copy it down. All right, um, so, <clears throat> Uh, first question is about uh, accessing uh, light curve data for an object. Um, so the guy light curve, what if you have a, a variable star that you would like to monitor, but there was not an alert put out for it, where should you go to mm -hmm. find the data on it? Unfortunately, uh, that data is not available yet. Um, it will be made available in the fourth Gaia data release, which is not um, been officially announced exactly when that will be but it's probably going to be in around three years time or so three or four years time um, then all of that data will be made available but at the moment uh, as i said there are other groups in uh, within the gaia team that that work on on um, these variable stars as well um, and making sure that they are very precisely calibrated um, before this data is released. So at the moment, um, we just have special permission to publish things that are alerts with the idea that these are things that need um, immediate observations in order to make, in order not to lose the scientific value. So for example, if you have a, a supernova um, and you only go and observe it in four or five years time, you know, it's probably not gonna be there anymore. Um, and that's why we released this data early and independent of the main guy data releases but yeah okay. soon that data will be available just not yet great okay thank you all right um next question comes from uh theory Minivane, who had asked is it possible to get the gaia filters bp and rp to uh deliver photometric in the gaia photometric system i i assume to get photometry from, oh, okay. I think I understand what it's saying. Can you purchase the BP and RP filters so that you can do your photometry in the Gaia photometric system? Huh. That's interesting. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. Um, there is um, very precise uh, curves available, uh, wavelength response curves for these filters. Um, so if you can have, you know, if, if you if you know somebody who can make filters to that sort of specification, um, you know, the, the response curves are available. Um, but I don't know of any that exist, uh, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. Another question about the filters. This one's from uh, Jose Bosch, who had asked, um, what kind of filters is uh, Gaia using in order to do photometry? Uh, so it has it has the three filters. The main um, the main uh, filter is is called the G band filter, capital G band filter, and that's essentially uh, a white light filter. Um, 
And then uh, it has these uh, the two BP and RP filters, blue photometer, red photometer filters, that essentially splits that in half. Um, I forget exactly now. I think it's from about, uh, I'm not going to get this right, but it's from about uh, 360 nanometers to just past H alpha. Um, and then from just before H alpha to about, um, I think just short of nine, 900 nanometers. Those are the, the BP and RP filters. So it's just the, the three filters um, for it uses for, for the photometry. Okay, thanks. Um, all right, next question from Dennis Conti, who had asked, is the Gaia team looking at using machine learning to automatically and therefore more quickly identify uh, transients? Uh, yes, that is something that, that we are working on, and it's something that we use as a tool internally, um, but it's not something that, that we published. It was initially um, one of the things that we wanted to do to be able to give a probabilistic um, a classification and say, you know, we are 60% sure that this is a type 1A supernova, um, you know, or whatever the case may be, but um, we decided not to to do that um, because the initial um, the initial tool was developed on on um, modeled spectra rather than the data, and then it just became a, a sort of a, a scarcity of of um, human power to to try and extend that to 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 the real data. So there is something uh, available. We found that um, it it does well at classifying supernovae, um, it does less well at, at classifying other things. And that was my, uh, the main reason for, for not um, uh, including that in, in, in the data that, that we published. But it is something that we do is, and it's something that, that we work on um, all at the moment. Interesting, thank you. All right, um, next up, we had several comments come in from John Merle. However, before I read those out, um, I just want to say that even if you're watching this on Facebook, please feel free to submit questions as comments um, and I will check that. So um, first comment from John Merle was that uh, it is worth pointing out that the number of alerts more than doubles for each magnitude. So the majority of the alerts are between 18th and 19th magnitude and that there are few, if any, bright alerts due to the dynamic range of Gaia. So do you have any comments to add to that? Um, I can say that that is correct, yes. <laughs> um, uh, the, the alerts do tend to be, tend to be faint, um, but we do also detect some, some bright alerts. We've seen uh, a number of novi that have been very bright, um, cataclysmic variables that are, you know, mm -hmm. 13, 14th magnitude in outburst, we, we regularly see those as well. Uh, they're just uh, a lot fewer um, new ones of, of those, but we have actually found, found those as well. Something like uh, Gaia 14 AAE that I, that I mentioned as, as one of my favorites, that was detected at um, I think 13, 13th magnitude, um, and that was a, 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 a new object. But you're absolutely right in saying that they are, they are more uh, trans at, at faint magnitudes. All right, uh, we had a question come in that is um, related to that. So I'm gonna go ahead and read that out. This is from Alessandro Iterkolite. Sorry if I mispronounced your name. Um, what is the detection threshold for the detection of transients? Hi, Ale. <laughs> um, this is a, a, a a question uh, that, that we got several times before. And during that, um, that learning curve, as I said, how things changed, that was one of the things we fixed. So we insist that an alert needs to be brighter than 19th magnitude before we will publish it. Anything that's never reached 19th magnitude will, uh, will not get published. Um, and that's just to try and, and, and be complete to a specific uh, magnitude. But it needs to have reached 19th magnitude um, in its light curve somewhere before it will be published. Okay, thank you. Um, so speaking more about the conditions for an alert, John Merle had a comment that um, we should all be aware that the Gaia alert system 
will only alert once on a particular object. So after the alert, it might go on to do all sorts of strange things without further alerts. So it's worth going back and reviewing the old alerts to check if anything unusual is happening. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's why I said the, the light curves um, and the guide data on, on those web pages get updated with every new uh, scan of, of that part of the sky. Uh, and so it's, it's really interesting. You can actually lose a lot of time by just simply <laughs> clicking through some of the old alerts and, and seeing what the light curves have, have been doing. Uh, so yeah, that's definitely worth, worth looking at some of the old ones as well. I predict I'm going to lose a lot of time to that today. <laughs> yeah, sounds like a treasure trove. All right, and um, last comment from John Merle for now. Um, he says that he has found about 10 eclipsing binaries in the alert st stream that managed to escape the culling process. So yeah. I don't know if you want to comment on that. Yeah, I mean, um, that's, that's absolutely true. We don't get it right all the time. Um, and, and that's also why we uh, keep improving our, our detections, uh, detection algorithms, so that we can exclude those. So every time we find one of those and, and we can identify why it was included when it shouldn't have been, um, we make a note of that. And, and with, a, with the next iteration, we see if it is possible to try and exclude uh, binaries like that uh, automatically. But you're absolutely right. There are a few that, that snuck in. There are also a few pulsating, uh, uh, like Myris, that, that, that made its way into, into some of the early alerts that, that really shouldn't have been there. And now when I, when I look at some of those, I think you know that's not something that I would I would okay for for publishing now just from what we've learned. Mm -hmm. um, it also makes a very very big difference the amount of data that you have. So very early on in, in the survey where we only had a few data points, it was much much harder to um, to see these these eclipsing binaries or to see these pulsating stars. You know, instead you'll just see something that brightens. It was only when we we add um, more, more data, you know, what we are in now four or five years more data that you can see, oh, this thing actually goes down again and comes back up and this must be eclipsing binary, or this is something that, you know, has a, a sinusoidal variation. Um, so yeah, the amount of data available does make a, a very big difference. Uh, and a few of them have certainly snuck in. That makes a lot of sense. Thanks. All right, uh, next question comes from Wayne Clark, who had asked, will the uh, DR4 data be accurate enough to draw light curves of small amplitude, so less than one-tenth of a magnitude variability, uh, specifically asking about red variables in the mag range of four to six? Um, I don't know off the top of my head, because that is something that's, that's done by the, um, by the uh, CU5 processing unit, and that's not anything that I have access to, to, to those numbers, so I can't say exactly. Um, but what I can say is that, you know, we see um, a lot of, especially these, these candidate microlensing events, a lot of them are very bright. I mean, okay, not quite as bright as fourth magnitude, but as bright as eighth magnitude, for example. Mm. And in those, we can see, you know, 0.1 magnitude changes quite clearly. Thank you. Okay, um, and then we have a comment here from Sebastian Otero. Hi, Sebastian. Um, he said, in VSX, we try to classify them before uploading them, uh, which is something we do on a daily and, or weekly basis, um, if we can find enough information about the transient. Also, we will update their status when something is published in the literature about them, such as a follow-up by AVS observers or uh, published papers. So I'm assuming Sebastian's talking about when he uh, uploads the Gaia transients to VSX. He adds okay. that information. Yeah. Um, yes, I, I have noticed that, uh, that, that some of them are you know, classified as, say, for example, a, a UGM object, an uh, outbursting CV. Um, but you know, that we decided that we will only add the classification if it is a confirmed classification. And that's the idea of that comment field that we could say in this that this is a candidate CV. We believe that this is what it is, but we do not have a spectrum or anything confirming that yet. Um, okay. 
but yeah, anyway, I would definitely encourage anyone to have a look at, at both the Gaia pages and then at VSX, um, because it does have a lot of uh, additional information in there. Thank you. Now, um, there's a question about the uh, BP and RP spectra that you were showing. Can you elaborate? Um, I had thought that BP and RP were simple photometric filters like a Johnson V or B filter. How do you get those spectra? Um, so those are uh, those are, are slitless um, spectra in um, in the the focal plane of of the telescope. Um, uh, and and I just project it onto a, onto a separate set of, of CCDs. As I said, they're very, very low resolution. Um, and so for the majority of, of stars, they're actually just a color. Um, they, they're not, uh, for, for the fainter objects, you know, you, you can't really use them as spectra, uh, but uh, instead just uh, an integrated color. Um, but they're slitless um, spectra on the, uh, on the focal plane. That's very interesting. Is that in addition to the photometry or is that the source of the uh, BP and RP photometry? That's the source of the BP and RP photometry. Interesting. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's integrated uh, magnitudes. Thank you. Okay, um, next up, uh, we had a question asking, hypothetically speaking, if there were a pair of Gaia satellites and they're stationed on opposite sides of Saturn's orbit, would that increase the Gaia's parallax range by a factor of 10? Um, I'll have to think about you know, what exactly the factor is, but in principle, yes, um, that would be amazing. Um, <laughs> the, um, uh, I'm, I'm guessing the, the biggest problem in that case will be the data downlinking, uh, because uh, that's something that, that really takes, uh, takes a long time. Uh, to, to get all of that data done and, and, and uh, do all of the, the processing. But in principle, uh, that would be a very nice thing to do. <laughs> For sure. Okay. Um, next question from John Merle. Can you comment on what the faint blue transients are that appear just above the threshold for a few measurements and then disappear? Um, no is the short answer um but i i i think i mean because that you know when i when i look at those transients i will look at things like um how bright they are you know how much variability there are in you know in the light curve overall uh it might be um things like uh flare stars something else that i don't think i mentioned but that we now use as well is the uh the data from uh, gaia data release 2 um, and if it's something that that had a, a, a distance measurement in, in Gaia data release too, we can place them on the HR diagram and that can give us some sort of idea of, of what they are as well. But um, sometimes uh, flares on, uh, even, if, even if they occur on, on quite red stars, um, the short timescale flares can really be quite blue. Hmm. And, in, and on, um, on, 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 on late type stars, they um, they can be quite bright as well. So I, you know, that's that's one thing I can think about that you know that that could produce uh, something like that. Interesting. Thank you. All right. And next question comes from uh, Sandapan, who had asked, "How can we access the BP and RP spectra for an arbitrary Gaia source?" Um, again, for an arbitrary Gaia source, uh, that is not available yet, um, but that is something that will be included in the next uh, Gaia data release, um, which will be sometime next year. Um, that will include um, an average BPRP spectrum for, um, I want to say, all sources, for all sources included in, in, the, um, in the data release. Awesome. All right, thank you. It uh, looks like that's it for our questions. Let me just check and make sure no one, yep, no questions on Facebook. So I'm gonna go ahead and put up the end card here and give the closing announcements. There we go. Okay, so first of all, the most important announcement 
I would like to extend a huge thank you to Dr. Breet for sharing her time and knowledge with us today. I would also like to uh, thank again our sponsors, DC Through Dreams and Voice Astro. DC Through Dreams provides high end observatory automation and web based multi user remote imaging. The AAVSO Net Observatories use DC Through Dreams ACP Expert for the Bright Star Monitors and other programs. The AAVSO Photometric All Sky Survey Project, also known as APAS, has used ACP Expert's AI scheduler to automatically acquire over 500,000 star fields, hands off, at a rate of 1,000 square degrees per night. This has resulted in photometry for over 128 million objects in about 99% of the sky. The Boyce Research Initiative and Education Foundation provides online astronomy education, observatory resources, and research experiences to students, student teams, and schools in order to learn how to perform observations, conduct research, and publish their results in scientific journals, such as the Journal of the AAVSO. Today's webinar has been recorded, and the recording will soon be made available for free on the AAVSO's YouTube channel. Go check it out. You will find a full library of webinars just like these from the past two years. And uh, while you are there, please consider subscribing to our channel. Not only will you get a notification every time that we post a new educational video, but by hitting the subscribe button, you're actually making YouTube more likely to suggest our videos to others, which helps us increase our educational reach. That's just one more way that you can help support the AAVSO. Speaking of support, this webinar series is being supported by you, the viewer. So please, if you're not a member, join the AAVSO. AAVSO membership comes with a wide array of benefits, including free access to our mentorship program. And as always, we would be so grateful if you would consider donating to the AAVSO. Every donation matters and goes towards making programs like this one come to life. <laughs>